Tonight's Bible reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're reading the whole chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want, Already you have become rich, you have become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings, so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels, as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus which agrees with what I teach everywhere, everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are t- talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love? and with a gentle spirit. Now, I have to confess to you in preparing this and reading through my exegetical notes, I sort of almost asked myself, why did you only leave room for one sermon on this? You should have probably done four. Um, So we are not going to be able to cover this to the kind of depth that I would like. Uh, That's just the reality of the situation. So if I move through some things a little bit more quickly than others and pause at different places, uh, just uh, be understanding. It's just the reality of the nature of this particular passage that there is a huge amount of material that comes out of here and it's impossible to try and get through all of this in one shot. Um, We also want to just uh, farewell and give thanks to the Lord for Joel and Cassie. Joel and Cassie are getting married on Friday, uh, but Joel and Cassie, unfortunately, as some of our other young adults have discovered, can't afford to live in the area. It's just too expensive, and so that means they've bought a house outside of where we are quite a long way away, which is going to prevent them from being able to come back to the church 
on a regular basis. So they are, as a result of that, moving away. But we want to give thanks to God for Joel and Cassie, give thanks to the way in which uh, God has, uh, particularly Cassie, who's been with us much longer. Joel has come along more recently, uh, who has been engaged in serving the Lord in this church, and we want to recognize her service. We want to give thanks to God for the way that she has engaged, and uh, we will miss her. We hope we will see them from time to time, that they don't forget about us altogether. We certainly won't forget about them. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are deeply conscious of such a wonderful passage that speaks about a servant whose service exemplified his humility, exemplified his diligence, exemplified him giving of himself tireless, tirelessly for your gospel. A man who never boasted about anything, and yet he had good reason to boast. A man who never lauded it over others. A man who endured great suffering and hardship, persecution, hunger, never complained. A man who served you and went beyond his means in serving you, becoming tired and at times despondent because of the opposition that he experienced but who never once deviated from the path, never once compromised the gospel, never once allowed himself to get sucked into the world's way of thinking, but remained faithful to you till the end. And as we spend some time just looking at this particular chapter, we ask that you would help us to understand what kind of impact, what kind of application it has for us. That you would help us make whatever adjustments are necessary. That we might see in the life of the Apostle Paul, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ coming through. Whom Paul loved and served and wanted to know above all else. May you help us to become like Jesus. For his sake we pray. Amen. He was not too well an educated man. And his manner was somewhat crude and rough. But he became a Christian and was on fire for the Lord. He constantly pestered the pastor to help him to be of some genuine service to the church. As pastor, you love people like that who come and pester you to want to serve. And... Uh, in desperation, the pastor gave him a list of 10 people saying, these are members who seldom attend services. Some are prominent men in the city. Contact them in any way you can and try and get them to be more faithful. Use the church stationery to write letters if you want, but get them back to church. He accepted the challenge with enthusiasm. About three weeks later, a letter arrived from a prominent physician whose name was on the list. In the envelope was a $1,000 check and a note, Dear Pastor, encloses my check to the makeup for the missed offerings. Gee, I wish that would happen here. I'm sorry for missing worship so much, but be assured I'm going to be present every Sunday from now on and will not by choice miss services again. Sincerely, M.B. Jones, M.D. P.S. Would you kindly tell your secretary there's only one T in dirty and no C in skunk? Now, obviously, an enthusiastic man wanting to serve the Lord went a little bit overboard in that service. But at least there was a willingness to engage in service. And the Apostle Paul, as he writes in this particular chapter, gives us a picture of what a true servant heart looks like. He shows us through his own service and through his arguments in this passage of how he has tirelessly served the Lord Jesus Christ and lays down an example for us to follow so that when he gets towards the end of the chapter, he makes that startling claim and uses those startling words, imitate me. Now think about that for a moment. Could you say that? 
Could you turn to a Christian and say, imitate me. Come and live with me. Live in our house. See how I occupy. Come with me when I go to work, a younger Christian. Watch me. Observe me. And then imitate me. That's quite a claim. But the Apostle Paul says that in relation to saying, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. In other words, the Apostle Paul's life is so conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ that over a number of years he has demonstrated that he is living the way Jesus has called him to live, and as a result of him imitating the Lord Jesus Christ, he can turn to this church and he can say to them, imitate me. And can I encourage you and say to you, that should be every Christian's words to younger believers. Firstly, I want you to notice, servants are faithful. Look at verses 1 to 5. Servants are faithful. So then, Men ought to regard us as servants. Can I just pause there very quickly, very briefly? Now, all of you know that the word that is generally used for servants is the word doulos. We all know what doulos is. Paul uses a different word here. And it's interesting that in the original language, he doesn't use the word doulos to talk about servants. And the reason he doesn't use it is because he wants to bring out a, a slightly different dimension of what a, service, a servant is in this particular passage. And the word that he uses conveys the sense of someone who is a, an assistant, someone who is a helper, someone who is under the authority and submissive to another. So in a sense, what the Apostle Paul is saying is that I'm under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm his assistant. I'm his helper. I don't rise above him. I simply submit to whatever the Lord Jesus Christ commands me to do. He has totally become the Lord's captive, and he will obey the Lord Jesus Christ in every area and do whatever God calls him to do. He is a willing servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me keep the reading. Uh, regard as the servants of Christ, as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now, if we were paused again, verse 1, when he talks about the secret things of God, he is not talking about that which is hidden, but rather the word that is used is the word in the original language that is better translated, the mystery of God. And the reason, as we have discovered previously in Corinthians, that he talks about it being a mystery is because to the unbeliever, they don't understand the gospel. The cross is a mystery to them. They don't have full insight into why we would proclaim that kind of a gospel. And so there is a darkness that surrounds them, and they are plunged into that darkness. And so the Apostle Paul says, I proclaim the gospel. It's been entrusted to me. I'm the guardian of the gospel. And it is something that, as I proclaim, is not understood by the broader society. Now, you will see why he says that as we get a bit more into the text, because it is a gospel that he proclaims that is not being proclaimed by the Corinthians who are watering down the gospel and are changing the gospel to make it more palatable to the secular ears. And so as a result of that, they are compromising their faith. Paul won't do that. Because he recognizes that this gospel has been entrusted to him. It has been given to him as a trust. And he is a guardian of that gospel. And he doesn't have the right to change it. He doesn't have the right to alter it to suit the ears of of the people to whom it is being preached. He continues. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So we can see now he wants to speak about the faithfulness of remaining true to the trust. What is the trust? It is the message of the gospel. I care very little if I am judged by you or by human, uh, any human court. Indeed, I do not judge myself. Now, this is very, very important. What the Apostle Paul is saying to these Corinthians is you have already formed judgment over the ministry God has given me, and you have condemned me in the preaching of the gospel. 
You say that uh, the, the ministry I'm exercising is not the right kind of ministry I should be exercising because you're exercising a different ministry to me. And so you have over lunch, had lunch, and you've condemned me, and you've written me off, and you consider yourself superior to me, and you have judged the ministry God has given me. And he says to them, I want you to understand, the ministry that I've been given, I am directly accountable to God, and only God can judge me. You don't have the right, neither do you have the insight, nor do you have the knowledge to be able to know exactly what's going on in the ministry God has given me. You don't have that kind of information for you to be able to make a right judgment. So he says to him, I care nothing if you judge me. Judge me all you want. At the end of the day, the ministry that God has given me and trusted to me, I stand or fall before that God. And he recognizes and understands that at the end of the day, only God knows whether or not he has been faithful to the ministry. Now, the, the, the Apostle Paul is not saying that we should not make judgments in any situation, because a little bit late, in fact, in the very next chapter, chapter 5, he is going to speak about a judgment that needs to may, be made about someone who's committing a, a, adultery with his stepmother. And so he's going to say the church needs to judge that person in the realm of morality, but in the realm of the preaching and the ministry God has entrusted to him as an apostle, they have no right to judge him according to secular standards, according to secular wisdom, according to whether or not they think he's successful or not successful, whether or not there are enough people being converted under his ministry, whether they think he's not using the right kind of methodology. Only God is able to judge him. Now, they considered Paul to be a fool. They thought in terms of uh, secular standards on how we judge people, and they thought that what Paul was doing was simply foolish. And so they, they stood in superior wisdom to Paul. They stood above him, and they looked down upon Paul, and they reduced him to someone who was an idiot, according to their secular standards. He goes even further. Notice what else he says. I think this is so, so important, and I'll explain to you why. I do not even judge myself. Those words are so very critical because what the Apostle Paul, in effect, is saying, that when I think in terms of the ministry that God has entrusted to me, I can't even make correct judgments about the success or failure of that ministry. Not even I have the right insight to know whether or not what I'm doing is going to be ultimately fruitful in the kingdom of God. I don't know what my motives are. I don't know what's going on in the unconsciousness of my heart. Maybe I'm preaching the gospel out of wrong motives. Maybe not every time I'm engaged in ministry, I'm at the right place where I ought to be spiritually. So I don't take time trying to judge whether or not my motives are correct, whether or not I'm doing the right thing all the time in terms of the motives that are coming from my heart. Because at the end of the day, the Lord knows. God looks into his heart. God sees his motives. God understands why he's doing what he's doing. And Paul is able to say, you know, I'm going to leave that with God. Instead of becoming anxious about whether I've got the right motives, instead of becoming and losing sleep over whether or not I'm doing all the things that I should be doing, I'm going to continue to be faithful to what God has called me to do according to my understanding of what faithfulness means, and I'm not going to allow any other evaluation to determine whether or not I'm a success or failure. I'm going to put myself in the hands of Almighty God. Do you hear that, Christian? Because I think far too often in Christian ministry, we judge people on whether or not they're a success or failure. We judge them on their charismatic or non-charismatic personality. Oh, look at that person. They just draw people to themselves. Aren't they so great? 
Well, look at that person. Look how, how the ministry they're engaged in has, has grown so much. Look how many, how many numbers have increased and it's become overflowing. And, and aren't they doing such a good, good job? And then look at that person over there. They've been ministering and laboring away year after year after year, and there's been zero change. And we evaluate people like that. And Paul says that's secular standards. That's how the world judges people. And he says, I won't do that. Because at the end of the day, God may have called me to labor in a place year after year after year without seeing any outward success. Only for the next person who comes after me to enjoy the fruit of the foundations that I've laid. And so he puts himself in the hands of Almighty God. Notice what he says. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness. He will expose the motives of men's heart. And at each, that time, each one will receive his praise from God. So the Apostle Paul, in effect, is saying, my conscience is clear. In other words... In terms of my faithfulness to the gospel, in terms of my faithfulness in preaching, in terms of my faithfulness in evangelism, in terms of my faithfulness in church planting, in terms of my faithfulness in teaching those whom I've, where I've planted the churches, my conscience is clear. I, before God, am satisfied that I've done all that I need to do in that process. And if you want to judge me, well, you do that at your own peril. Because at the end of the day, none of you can look into my heart and determine what my motives have been. But God can and God will. And one day on Judgment Day, when we stand before God, He will take all those things that I've done and He will weigh them in the scales. And He will say whether or not what I've engaged in has been fruitful or not. But only He can judge that. Because He alone knows what's going on deep inside my soul. And so he says, my conscience is clear. That doesn't make me innocent. In other words, he's saying, that, that, that doesn't mean that I haven't done things I ought not to have done. This is not a claim to, to not have done some things I ought not to have done. But at the end of the day, I leave that in the hands of God. Now let me tell you what that does. I think what it does is it frees you up to minister. Because instead of worrying about what people think, instead of becoming concerned about whether or not you're seeing outward success in ministry, you know what God wants from you? Faithfulness. He wants you to plow forward day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. And leave the results up to him. And stop thinking that because you've been plowing away in a particular ministry area, and from an outward human perspective, it doesn't look as glossy as some others who have been laboring in another area of ministry. Don't get into a comparison game, don't negatively judge yourself. Don't think that somehow your ministry is inferior to those who have seen greater outward success. Because sometimes people use methodologies that are inconsistent with Scripture. And so, yes, there may be a great outward success, but the way they've achieved that doesn't necessarily conform with the biblical mandate. But don't even judge them. Because at the end of the day, God is the one who is going to bring this to light. And all those hidden motives in our hearts that no one else sees, and all those hidden moments where we've been alone, and all those things that we may have covered over and we may have hidden from other people, that's all going to come to the surface. And God's going to bring it to light. Therefore, he warns the Corinthians against judgment because it, be, it is before God he stands or falls. And what is absolutely fundamental for the Apostle Paul is that he is faithful. And let me tell you, faithfulness sometimes is very hard. 
It's very hard. If I had to tell you, and, and it's, it's my object to do that tonight, but if I were to, to tell you the, the many times that sometimes criticism comes over things not just concerning what I'm doing, but concerning what the church is doing or concerning what others are doing in ministry, sometimes it becomes very disillusioning. And people are making judgments. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Why isn't the church engaged in this? Why isn't the church engaged in that? And we should be doing things like this, and we should be doing things like this, and cut your sermon down to 20 minutes. That's enough. And people judge. But ultimately, me, like you, stand or fall before God. And Paul, in effect, is saying, I'm more concerned with what God thinks than with what anyone else thinks. Because to him I will account for whether or not I've been faithful. And that's all that matters. And it's true of you and it's true of me. Secondly, servants are humble. Look at verses 6 to 13. Servants are humble. Now, brothers, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. It's a very difficult phrase to translate just by the way or to under know what he means by what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why did you boast as though you did not? Let me just pause there for a moment. So the Paul continues on along this line and he says to them, you know the problem with you Corinthians, or not all of you, but some of you Corinthians, is that you're boasting about the gifts that God has given you. And as a result of your boasting, you, you're promoting yourself. And you're allowing yourself to get caught up in this self-promotion, this self-pride. Look at what I've done. Look at the spectacular gifts I've got. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 14, 15 is going to deal with some of the way in which the gifts are being abused. This was a very gifted church. All the gifts were operating, and there were some problems in the way in which they were operating. And some of these people were boasting and saying, ah, you don't have the kind of gift I have. Look at the spectacular gift I have. I have the gift of prophecy, and I stand up and I prophesy. You've got the gift of uh, uh, helps, and, and so whatever you're doing is in the background. It's got nothing compared to me. And so there was this two-tiered Christianity being created. You know, the ones that were spectacular, upfront, involved, and, and everyone saw what they were doing, and then you had the other lot who were doing things in the background that no one saw. And they were kind of a second-rate, a second-class Christian. They didn't really count. It's only the people who are up front that mattered. And the Apostle Paul will have nothing of it. What makes you different from anyone else, he says. And then he argues and he says to them, do you not understand that whatever you have, whatever gift you have, is given to you by the grace of God? And if it's given to you by the grace of God, there is no room for boasting. How can there be? It's a gift. And it's a gift given to you not because you deserve it, not because you are worthy, not because you are better than anyone else, but according to God's sovereignty. And he'll come to that in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 12, where he says the gifts are distributed according to how God sees fit to distribute those gifts. And he doesn't give everyone the same gifts. So how can you boast? There's no room. You can't boast. And then he says... And he uses incredible irony here. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings and that without us. How I wish that you had really become kings so that we would be kings with you. Now let me try and explain what's going on here. One of the problems the Corinthian church had to deal with was an over-realized eschatology an over-realized end times view, 
What that meant is that the Corinthians were under, not all of the Corinthians, some of the Corinthians were under the false impression that as a result of having been converted, as a result of the kingdom of God breaking into the world, that this consummated kingdom of God had now fully realized itself in the world. And they were now living as part of God's consummated kingdom. They were wealthy. They were rich. They had lots of money. They were very prominent in the city. They were well respected. They were honored. And they thought now they were part of this, this over or this kingdom of God that has broken into the world, but now it's been consummated. In other words, they were having their own private millennium. It was their own private kingdom. This was the kingdom of God now fully realized in this, in this uh, particular society. And so a uh, little later on, he's going to deal with the problem of sexual ethics in that because they were saying, look, we, we, we don't need to engage in marriage anymore because we're part of the consummated kingdom. It's, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's arrived. And, and so they were living like kings and living as though they were part of that consummated kingdom. And Paul wants to correct this view of eschatology. All that God has planned for us, all that is yet to come, hasn't yet occurred. So contrary to a popular preacher, your best life is not now. Your best life is yet to come. Because it's in that consummated kingdom, when we go to be with Christ, that we will experience all that Christ has prepared for us. And then we will experience health, and then we will experience perfection. But it's not for this world. And so while the kingdom of God is broken into this world, and God's kingdom is evidence wherever you see Christians, wherever you see people converted and taken out of darkness into light, that is not God's consummated kingdom. And they thought it was. And so they were comparing themselves to the Apostle Paul. And they were saying, look at us. We, we are ruling. We are in power. We have money. And the Apostle Paul ironically says, I wish that was so, because if that was so, I'd be ruling with you. But in contrast, notice what he says. For it seems to me, verse 9, that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. Paul is saying, we're at the other end. If you're right, then we're wrong. If what you're saying is true, then we're living a lie. Like men condemned to die in the arena, we have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as men. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, not only are we a spectacle in the world, but as the spiritual forces look down, we are a spectacle to them too. We, have been, uh, we are fools for Christ. I saw a great t-shirt that once said, I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We are work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth and the refuge of the world. Do you hear that language? If there was ever a passage of Scripture that cut across prosperity preaching, it's this one. Because here are the Corinthians, some of them, saying, we're enjoying prosperity. Paul is saying, we are at the opposite end of the scale. We are considered scum, pieces of dirt that you scrape off. We are considered refuge, refuse that you just chuck away in the bin. We are despised. We are being persecuted. We are suffering. We don't have houses to stay in. We go hungry. We've experienced all of this. And you know why? Because we've remained faithful to the gospel. That's why. And you saying that, that you're living like kings. So who's right and who's wrong? And the point that the Apostle Paul is making, of course, is that when you stick faithfully to the gospel, and when you preach the cross of Christ, and when you will not compromise your stand on the gospel, you are going to sometimes suffer as a result. It's inevitable. Goes with the ground. 
And so, so much for these people who preach, well, we should all be wealthy and we should all be healthy and it should all be a, a good life now. And, you know, if you just pray hard enough and you pray long enough and you claim it e enough, you know, name it, claim it and frame it kind of theology, then you, you can have anything you want. Paul says, we are right at the, the dregs. We are hated. We are despised. People don't like us. They reject us. They make life difficult for us. They are like people being led into the arena, about to be slaughtered in front of the crowd. Wow. Completely opposite. In other words, their form of Christianity that the Apostle Paul preaches is not at home in the world. It's not. You see, there is a sense in which you and I can, I'm not saying anyone does that here, but there's a sense in which Christians can sometimes have a, a form of Christianity that is very accepted by the world. It doesn't confront the world with the gospel. It kind of lives in a, in a comfortable, non-confrontational way. It enjoys all the comforts of the world. There's very little distinction between it and the world. It kind of just blends into the world and we embrace, it can embrace some of the values of the world. And, and when we speak about the gospel, we speak about it in very general terms, non-specific Hell doesn't enter into our vocabulary. Repentance is removed. Sin is not spoken about because that's uncomfortable. And we don't want to talk about sin and put people off and chase them away. And so we just talk about the love of Jesus and how Jesus loves everyone and Jesus wants everyone to come to him. And when you come to Jesus, your life is going to be happy and fulfilled and you're going to have a great time. We never talk about the cost. We never talk about the sacrifice. We never talk about the fire of hell and the unending pain and suffering that awaits those who stand in rebellion to God because that's uncomfortable. We never talk about the cost of following Jesus the giving of ourselves over entirely to his service so that he has absolute say over our lives, what we do, what we say, how we live. Our priorities are now brought under the lordship of Christ because that's too restrictive. Now that's a comfortable Christianity that the Corinthians were engaged in. And Paul says our kind of radical Christianity that speaks about the cross, that speaks about what God says in Acts, God commands all men everywhere to repent. That speaks about the sacrifice of Jesus for the sin of the world. That speaks about perhaps going homeless, being persecuted, suffering for the gospel. That's the gospel we proclaim. And when we are faithful to that gospel, this is the result. We are plagued by the world that rejects us. Did not Jesus say to his disciples that if you were faithful, the world was going to make life difficult for you? But he will not compromise. He slogged away in hard work, wearing some work. He was happy to be considered the dregs of society. Do you know why? Because he was following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read to you Isaiah 53, verses 2 and 3. He grew up like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. When you see these nice pictures of Jesus Christ, it's not biblical. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us. He didn't look 
handsome. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Till eventually he was strung up on a cross. Now if you are a Christian, the path of following the Lord Jesus Christ means that you have to share in his sufferings. Listen to the Apostle Paul. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, Philippians 3.10. And the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. Becoming like him in his death. Well, Paul lived that. Those weren't just empty words from Paul. He lived that. Or Romans 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God. Co-heirs with Christ. If we indeed, we share in his sufferings. In order that we might share in his glory. In other words, we share in his sufferings in the here and now. Precisely so that one day we might share in his glory. Suffering is part of this world. And Jesus exemplified it, and so did Paul. So let me ask you, are you willing to endure suffering for the sake of Christ? Are you willing to be called a fool for Christ? Are you willing to be shamed for Christ? Are you willing to suffer people laughing at you because you believe in a fairy tale according to them? Are you willing to be bold in your evangelism? Are you willing to call people to repentance? Are you willing to tell them about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the world? Are you willing to endure people rejecting you, rejecting the message you bring for the sake of Jesus? Let me tell you, if you're going to be faithful to the gospel, you are going to suffer in some way. Paul writing to Timothy says, everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. And then thirdly, servants are examples. Look at verses 14 to 21. Servants are examples. I'm not writing this to shame, you know. See the tender heart of Paul. He's not writing this in order to embarrass the Corinthians. This is an admonition. This is to warn them. This is to say to them out of the, the love he has for them, please understand you need to make some adjustments. But to warn you, to admonish you is the original word. As my dear children, it's precisely because Paul loves them that he wants them to understand there needs to be a change in the way that they are acting. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers in Christ Jesus. I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Now, what he means by that is there are a whole lot of people in the Corinthian church who are willing to be instructors and teachers. The word for guardian that is used there is the word that is used of a guardian who would take children to school and back from school and would instruct the children and look after them and be part of their lives. And he says, you've got lots of those, lots of people who want to instruct you, but they're leading you down the wrong path. So he says, I am your father in Christ, in the sense that it is a result of his preaching in Corinth that the Corinthians came to faith in Christ Jesus. So in a, an original sense, the Apostle Paul is saying, I am the one who has fathered you. Now, not in a, in a material sense, not in a literal sense, but in a spiritual sense. I am the one through the preaching of God that he used in order that you should become Christians. Therefore, he says, as a result of that, and as a result of my life, imitate me. And Paul is going to continue 
continue to say, I'm going to send to you Timothy, and Timothy will verify everything I've said to you. And Timothy, who has lived with me and seen me in action and observed how I've lived, he will be able to verify that you can imitate me. And so he says, verse 16, Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is also faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. What a testimony. Here is an apostle who's able to say, Timothy's going to come your way, and Timothy is going to say to you, I've lived with Paul. I've watched Paul in action. I've seen Paul go from place to place. I've observed his teaching. I've observed his way of life. I've seen his speech. I've seen his attitudes. I've seen his diligence. I've seen everything about Paul, and I can verify you. It's consistent with what he believes. Isn't that the challenge of every Christian? Words can be cheap, can't they? But words backed up by actions, that's different. Where there is a consistency of life that affirms the testimony of the lips, that's what really matters in God's kingdom. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon if the, Lord, if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? And in effect, what the Apostle Paul is saying, the reason some of you have become so arrogant is because you think I'll never come. And so while I'm away, while the cat is away, the master are play. And so if I'm not physically present there, you think you can get away with what you're getting away. And if you think I'm never going to come to you, you can keep perpetuating these untruths and you can keep living in a false way that is not reflective of uh, who Christ is and you think you can get away with it forever. And he says, I'm sending you this letter in the hope that you will listen to it and you will make some changes. But if necessary, I will come. If God so wills it, he recognizes that his ability to go there is dependent upon God's sovereign purposes. So if the Lord wills. And then he says, I will deal with you in person. But he hopes that he doesn't have to do that. He hopes in this letter as he writes to them and sending Timothy there that as a result of that, there will be the necessary adjustments. But they are, if they aren't, then Paul's going to try and get there. And the Apostle Paul is urging these Corinthians, let your life conform to your words. And then he says, very importantly, you see, the kingdom of God is not about talk. We can talk all we want. We can articulate great theology. We can have great theological discussions. But if it doesn't result in action, it's just hot air. What matters is the power of God being exercised through people who have been converted, who have been transformed, who have been made new, and who have the power of God in them. When Jesus says to his apostles, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and he will come upon you in power, and you will go out and be my witnesses, because now you have a power that comes from God, and this power is evidence in the way in which you live, in the actions you're involved in, in the ministries you engage in. It's not just about talk. Quite often when people may come and say, you know, I think we should be doing X, Y, and Z, my response is, well, why don't you do it? If that's your passion, get stuck in. It'd be great if you do it. Because we can all talk about what we'd like to do and what the church should and shouldn't be doing. But when it comes down to the rubber meeting the road, well, that's different, isn't it? Because that requires time and effort and resource and sacrifice. And then we might want to shrink back. What an example to follow. I'm going to end with a, a true story. 
This is about way back, 1865. A black man entered a fashionable church in the United States in Richmond, Virginia. When communion was served, he walked down the aisle and knelt at the altar. There was a rustle of resentment that swept through the congregation. How dare he? After all, believers in that church used a common cup. Suddenly, a, a distinguished layman stood up and stepped forward to the altar and knelt beside the black man. And with Robert E. Lee setting the example, the rest of the congregation soon followed. He was a great general. Can you say to a younger Christian, come, watch me, watch me. Observe the way I talk. Watch the way I, I treat my wife or husband. Look at the way I use my finances. Look at the way I'm engaged in ministry. Look at my faithfulness in church attendance and Look at me in the way in which I've sought to raise my children according to the Lord's commands. Look at the way I, I act when people oppose me and when people try and make life difficult for me. Look at, look at how I respond when someone gets angry with me. Look how I deal with those who resent me and who hate me. Watch me. Watch me. And then imitate me. If you're a more mature Christian here this evening, can I encourage you? Go to a younger person. Put them under your wing. And say, come, watch me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's true discipleship at its best. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. There's so much in this passage. We are deeply challenged by it. There's no doubt about that. As your servants, we are required to be faithful. As your servants, we are required to be able to set the right example. We are required to be fools for Christ. We are required to be humble. So help us as those who have been entrusted with the gospel to exemplify what true servanthood looks like. And may we, in the words of the Apostle Paul, say to all those who see us, imitate me as I imitate Christ, for Jesus' sake. Amen.